You ready for this? Yeah, man. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is William Burnett, and uh, I'm sitting here with uh, Matt McDermott, and uh, you're watching Talk Video. Um, what's up, man? How's it going? Oh, it's going well. It's good to be here. Um, you know, I've been excited about this project, so uh, and I like talking to you. It's uh, strange. Usually you're the one asking the questions. That's true. I kind of have a problem with that. Like uh, when I'm, when the few times I've been in an instance like on like a radio show or something where somebody's trying to ask me questions, I like quickly do some kind of mental judo. <laughs> you switch to interview mode. Yeah, I'm going to try to avoid that in this instance. It's okay. I, it's, you can do that if you want. But uh, well, I'll just direct it the other way, hopefully. Um, but uh, so uh, a little introduction. Um, uh, Mr. McDermott, uh, this this show uh, for those if you, if you, this is your first episode tuning in, um, it's a it's called Talk Video. It's a, a podcast video podcast, and it's about a, a music or or some sort of a whatever's going on. And I haven't there's not even a name for whatever the scene is now. Um, and uh, you your position at this point is it's been a long road, and you've been involved in many facets along the way. And uh, but right now you're you're a writer. Um, and that's at a at a big big establishment. Um, yeah, we're, you're a writer for re resident advisor, and that and that's your main daily activity. You're also playing in a band. You're the keyboard player uh, for a folk singer named Jessica Pratt. That's correct. And uh, and you're so you're traveling around. You're um, reviewing music and uh, you're checking stuff out. And you're also when they let you, you get to go on tour, and and you're the the, the backup band. That's exactly correct. That's a I, I didn't even know you knew all that. So yeah, man. Yeah, I yeah. go I go deep, and and yeah. uh, so um, we're gonna go. I I I don't think I even did. I even give you the link. Have you seen one of these before? I haven't. No, seen. No, I didn't. Oh, I, I sh I've seen the preview. That's it. Oh, I should have sent you a link because usually I, what I do is I go back and I I talk, kind of figure out your history, like what what tapes you were buying at the mall and stuff like that, um, and uh go from there and then kind of whatever direction happens and then at the end you get drunk and then you're like oh what am i talking about so perfect so that's what um so you're you're a you're a jersey jersey right actually suburbs of philadelphia philly oh, yeah, oh. yeah. Close but they're, to, close they're very to similar jersey. right yeah they are like i mean anywhere where there's a wawa anywhere where it's called a hoagie um <laughs> you know anywhere where like kind of uh like a blue collar underdogism um like mike Vallely. oh yeah Val yeah Vallely. yeah but he's a california guy isn't he no man no he's the east coast yeah yeah no i'm just i don't know that's what i picture i was like i was gonna say bruce springsteen but that doesn't even work at all i think that totally works i mean i think that springsteen was a massive enough figure that anybody who had anything to do with jersey <laughs> at least like partially modeled their personality after after the boss and I, m I mean are you a fan i don't know i don't mind it i don't i never i tried there's like that one record what is it the river is it what's it called is that the one the one that people talk about is nebraska nebraska yeah, that's yeah. It. And, and it's the one they're like oh they were he was recording it next to suicide and it sounds like suicide and i tried to listen to it a bunch of times but the last time i heard it i finally i think it was in a skateboard video or something mm. and i heard it again and i was like oh all right, maybe I'll try it again. Like, sometimes it takes me a while. No, understood. You know, I, there's actually a funny story about suicide and the boss that maybe you might be aware of. You, you probably are. But uh, when you know his cover of Dream Baby Dream. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're a fan of that cover? I don't know. It's a little well, it was, it, it's pretty... It, it it's a little Elvis or something. It is. But, uh, but I think Martin Rev said... That's the biggest honor I've ever had in my life. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that Springsteen covered the covered the tune, you know, and um, yeah, it was nice. So that's where you're from, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, uh, man. As Asbury Park. Uh, no, but you're so you're from some from outside of Philly. Yeah, I grew up in a little town called Habertown, and um, you know, it was the closest thing to like. It, w it was a staunchly middle class kind of Catholic uh, private schools. suburb. Yeah, uh, I I ended up going to a private Christian school actually. Sweet. Is it all boys? 
It was not all boys. It was co-ed, but but Ooh. like uh, you know, fairly yeah, it was pretty sexy. <laughs> but uh, but now, like, do you have to wear uniforms? It uh, there was a dress code, so like you'd have to tuck in your shirt. I I was like, I had like a bit of a row with the administration over the l- the length of my hair. Um, it couldn't go past your collar. Um, <coughs> or, or or cover your ears. It could, yeah, it couldn't it's cover like your it's ears. It's like the that's swimming right. pool rules. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> How we, did you also go? No, to no, no. Okay. That's the it's the exactly the same rules to go into a swimming pool. Like if you have to wear a cap or not. Oh really? Maybe that's what they were going by. Yeah, maybe they were going <laughs> by swimming rules. Because they knew you were going to get in the pool. Yeah, totally. No. <laughs> um, but, but did you have brothers and sisters? I had two brothers. Um, it, tying back to the sort of like religious upraising i have two younger brothers their names are mark and luke so it's matthew mark and luke holy jesus in in order of the gospel holy jesus I, d- I don't know if you you've like you've you've observed <laughs> like me attempting to be like a christ like personality but you know <laughs> that's where it's from yeah. interesting no i mean I, I think that's a pretty uh uh there's like a, a, the irish catholic philly kind of thing it's yeah, a, it's totally. A, it's a real, real deal. Yeah, um, yeah. You know about it a little bit, not that much. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I'm, yeah, we didn't have that where I'm from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Understood. <laughs> so what, what I mean, so you, gen- you, this is general. You had these general, general, uh, like a elementary school, like get beat up and uh, yeah, fighting with your brothers over your remote control or whatever, whatever toys. stupid thing. Um, do you remember a, a point where like music became an interesting thing in your life or, or where it was like a, you're like realized it was cool or you weren't, you were into it? Yeah. Um, I was always interested in music and I, th- we always had a piano in my house and I think that, um, my mother, my mother's Asian and that means that a general Asian, she's Taiwanese. Okay. She moved, um, from Taiwan to the suburbs of Philadelphia to study computer science in like 1975. She had like twenty dollars in her pocket. So when how she, she arrived. was twenty or something when she moved. Or yeah, about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, but yeah, sh- I guess I was like messing around with like a Disney melody mm-hmm. on the piano, and she's like, "Oh, we got to get this kid in piano <laughs> lessons." We figured him out. Yeah. So, uh, but then be- became that then that like started this long period where I was forced to practice like an hour a day oh and, that's good and it would be, you know, she was getting you to that 10,000 hours. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was like the source of like stress, you know, it's like, have she, has she seen you play? Yeah, she has. What'd she say? Was it weird? Um, yeah, she came to the Philadelphia show that we played recently and I think she enjoyed it. I, I mean, I don't know if they connect it to that. Like, I don't know if it's the same for you, but with your parents, like the idea of being really into music, at least in like a free sense, like you're not trying to be like a uh, concert violinist or something. It's it's always like, oh, that's like a terrible fucking idea, you know? Like you're you're into like records and and <laughs> nightlife and like get a job. Yeah, exactly. So so you know, it's 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 been like a long journey through that to like, oh, you're actually like like cobbling together a living doing is your dad you is like. your dad conservative too or he's conservative he reads the new yorker these days in the atlantic so he's gotten like less conservative as time has gone on but uh, but if you if you had to put my mother into some sort of cliched cliche like it would be like she's like a tiger mother like you know like you gotta you gotta what's the point of doing it if you're if you're not yeah, filling I, your potential you know I'm, I'm all for that too yeah is that how you would be if you were if you were a father? I'd be a tiger tiger mom y- too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean that's, a, I mean, I was a, uh, for those, I guess I probably said this. I was a swim coach for a long time, and that was one of the things I said. Like, if you're gonna be here, you may as well, you know, make the most of your time. Otherwise, we're just, just leave. You know, like, what's the point? So that I mean, I understand that uh, that point of view. Like, if you're gonna do it, try, try. You know, otherwise, you're just, uh, yeah. Ways, I mean, this is the, I, this goes back. One of my friends the other day said, uh, uh, he's also I think his family's also Taiwanese, and he was saying that his brother told him the other day that you're you're either there's two states of being you're either bored or you're suffering. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, and I've been thinking about it a lot, and it's kind of true. So um, I don't know, but so as a kid, 
your mom made you do piano lessons and and was that you were trying to play you said a disney song yeah i was trying to pick out some kind of disney song i don't i obviously don't remember and it. you're what you're like five, five. oh five. really little yeah, yeah, really yeah, little. small and and so you're so so little bitty kid uh p- piano lessons with what do you remember your teacher yeah um i i eventually was enrolled in this this uh like it was called the Nellie Berman School of Music, and it was these like Russian Jewish women who were like just as tough, but also like nurturing as as my mother was. And it was just like this this odd relationship where, you know, it it, it was just like no slouch style, you know, where it, it's it's like, uh, you know, there were kids in there who were just virtuosic, and I was just trying to like get by but they would know very quickly if i hadn't put in the work and so played played classical i've never been like as nervous to perform music in my life as in a classical recital and eventually just to skip forward so we're not dwelling on this small small moment even though it was like elementary and middle school i i I decided that i wanted to try to play jazz because i i thought that would be more relaxed and and at that point i like got into like bill evans and, and like and what is this is like 12 13 yeah about that so you so but is was there you had this piano thing with the mom was there any kind of like a you know were you buying like a, a motley crew tapes or, or a, i don't know how old you are we're, we're almost i'm 35 35 you're oh so you're a yeah. little you didn't you weren't buying tapes maybe cds yeah but i would for me it was like uh i guess like around that time it was the classic columbia house 13 cds uh, 13 cds for uh yeah, some some one G- cent some uh some uh what is it ned's atomic dustbin or or live or it something w- yeah it was just like a mix of like just like indefensible crap like you know just to like fill up that like 11th yeah CD. like it was like oh the i like those blues traveler songs on the radio i should get that cd but then like i i actually like hit it with one or two purchases which was like a uh, train spotting soundtrack oh yeah <laughs> yeah like you but that has like brian eno yeah, yeah, yeah. pulp underworld like that one's actually lou reed like that you can that's still listen to it to this day iggy pop right yeah yeah that's a strong soundtrack and you know if it was the internet era i probably would have like found some wormholes to follow there but but to be honest like the cool bands I was into in high school were like something like Big Star, which I found through like Wilco covering one of their songs yeah. or just like very early like Napster days. I, d- I didn't really like fully start to participate in any but kind of DIY yeah, culture. So, so time frame, this is like late 90s. Yeah, this is like or 99, or 2000. 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 2001, I went out to school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So your your childhood there there's not I mean the piano thing it was just kind of a uh, regular you weren't like going to punk rock shows or, or no I didn't I didn't taking, really taking ecstasy and going to raves <laughs> I was I was just like had like a really boring suburban existence you didn't, where you, didn't, you weren't aware of like Josh Wink or something like that no like no I mean I guess no I was aware of Six Eleven Records and you were like what is all this stuff yeah that and I was like I was like oh like raver stuff like what is acid jazz. You know, that sounds kind of cool. What is what is that? And, and then like you listen to it, and it sucks. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but but like six eleven, like I mean, Philly had like a that store was serious. Did yeah. you did you ever go? Yeah, 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 yeah. And and then, but it wasn't until I moved to Pittsburgh that I really just took it upon myself. So you went to Pittsburgh for college. Yeah, exactly. And and then like I kind of like uh, I think I was into like the Strokes and like. Bell and, Bell and Sebastian and oh stuff. Yeah. They were like all like coming Maybe out. Maybe little magnetic fields. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Like or like, uh, but then like people, I looked a certain way, so people thought I was like into music. They're like you like the Rapture. Yeah, yeah. So they they, wa- they weren't out yet, but oh. like they they w- started inviting me to shows. Okay. But then like I took it upon myself, and I still remember like the first show I went to. It was uh, like at an art gallery, and was it Manny Tellerama? Oh, dude, I know. I used to. <laughs> I have so many Manny. <laughs> Shout out to Manny Tellerama. Manny Tellerama booked uh, Will. Did, did he stab you? DJ TLR. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a big rumor with him is he got out a box cutter at a show that somehow like yeah. traveled to showing uh, a knife. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> Manny and I. I used to drive Manny around and work the door for him. I actually. like him. He seems cool, man. Manny, you can get along with everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't like. No, he's a freak, and he. I think he really contributed. You know, like whether or not he treated people, may, maybe did some things that weren't right. He still was a big part of the Pittsburgh scene. Like people, he got bands to play there. Oh, it's that it's you never would would have played any other, or they might have come another way, but he was definitely involved in a lot of bands coming there. Oh, it's it, his his uh, influence is massive, and it just just for a quick background here, we're speaking about a a promoter. infamous Pittsburgh promoter named Manny Thiner, and and he's booked Will on various Creme International tours. I think the first one was maybe in two thousand five, but he was also responsible for the first Nirvana show in Pittsburgh, uh, like stuff like Faust or Royal Trucks. Um, but he has zero social graces and he cares about sound, but he doesn't care about the cleanliness of his venue or just like any, any, no creature comforts. And for a while he was like living in the basement of his venue. And, and so he's, he's like sort of like made out to be this kind of like a basement dweller, music nerd figure and like he he's like a real snob like i remember one time i was going to see a show and i think it was like an animal collective show in maybe 2003 before they had become a uh, household name yeah before they had they were just like kind of aimlessly playing acoustic guitars at the time the campfire songs era and uh we showed up at the at the concert and he was like yeah we're here for the show and manny was like you sure you know, it's like it's like, like <laughs> classic like disdain for for the audience. You know, gatekeeper. That's the the, tr the 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 trigger word now, right? Yeah, I think he w he was a gatekeeper. You know, we need him. I think we need him. You know, I'm not allowed to say that, but yeah, yeah. We w the world needs gatekeepers, just like the world needs uh, ditch diggers. That's where you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, uh, yeah. I mean, whatever. You know, yeah. people can you know do what you got to do. Yeah. If you don't like it, don't go, you know. Totally. Um, it's, um, so <laughs> so you were in Pittsburgh, and you went to every Manny Tellerama show. I would and you start drove going to shows. You started going to shows. Yeah. And what, what what were you studying in college? Just I curious. Was, I was writing. studying uh, English writing. Oh, so yeah. yeah. And uh, history. history. And I, I thought I was going to, like, I was, like, very attracted to the idea of, uh, like, being a sort of, like, introspective person and trying to write fiction. <laughs> that was my idea. What, well, like what, uh, science fiction or just a just like fant? just like kind of like uh, like um, Stephen King. No, not not <laughs> Stephen King. <laughs> I Mike guess I guess like I would be like uh, Mark, into like Mark Twain. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to write allegorical political fiction. No, it was uh, like introspective stuff, like a like a Tobias Wolf or like a Raymond Carver oh, or like they're just like very simple. But uh, those but are American impactful stories. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and um, I didn't have any. Uh, I, I I had no business writing fiction. Well, you never you never yeah. know un until you try. Yeah, you know? totally. So why not? Um, so you're you're going to these shows in in, in two thousand between you're at school between after nine eleven, you're in you're in college in Pittsburgh. Yeah, nine eleven happened like six days after I got to school, and then was that weird there? Yeah, it was it was odd. There was like you were between you were between like DC and and New York. Yeah, we're and then then there was the flight that went down in the middle of Pennsylvania oh, as well. About that yeah, one too. yeah. What was that flight four or three? What was where was that one supposed to go? I don't remember. I don't know, but it was it was like a heroic. Oh, the, uh, the the crowd took took over. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that tripped me out, man. Like especially coming from such a sheltered environment, and I was probably like just like smoking a lot of weed at the time and probably in like a, a fragile mental state in general like um but yeah yeah that was that was that was weird and but that, that so sure that's like wasn't that's like your, your freshman year of, mm -hmm. of high school i mean college, college yeah, sorry. yeah yeah that's got to be pretty weird so you get there and you're like oh everything's cool and then uh, oh wait we can be attacked or something totally um so that i just want to that's like a, a good time marker for me so i can r relate to years um uh, so 2001 to four to five you're in school you're doing english lit 
you're you're getting good grades and uh going to shows did you ever did you start traveling much or did you join any bands because you're this great piano player i started a band uh it was called harangue and like the better parts of it were like kind of like uh almost sounded like synth pop with like like an affected 80s kind of like almost like joseph k like postcard records type of like more twee side of post-punk kind of thing and then the bad parts were like that's not a song that's just like four complex piano parts like kind of stitched together and i was playing with these guys you know that were my friends and that band lasted for a while actually we put out a what you, wang harangue harangue yeah H U R A N G H A R A N G U E. It means to like to to go on a tirade. Harangue. Yeah, and all the bands were so heavy in Pittsburgh. Like it was like if you weren't like a loud band, it was. And th- this was the time of that uh, zombie. Yeah, zombie was coming uh, out. What Japanther and that stuff or Japanther was from New, uh, New York, but but that what? that sort of feel. Lightning bolt, but that's Baltimore. Lightning Bolt is uh, uh, yeah, Providence. Not Providence, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, that that sort of stuff. Like I remember, that's, that's the time. Yeah, I was seeing like uh, memorable shows from that time include like, yeah, Lightning <laughs> Bolt, <laughs> Wolf Eyes, uh, oh, Wolf Eyes, yeah, like that that sort of thing. And then everybody was really into like math rock. But Pittsburgh. were you touring with that stuff or just playing local shows? A few like we we would play like bigger local shows here and there, and we play like I try to set up a tour, and we play like a an Ethiopian restaurant in Philadelphia or, um, Sounds about right. you know, a, a bar that nobody was at in Akron, Ohio, or, mm, you know, been, like there, been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like that, that sort of thing. It's good. It's form formative, you know? Yeah. You have to like, I, I also appreciated, I appreciate scenes that are still supportive, even though you, you fail a lot, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they, they like, how is that a failure? You went to the venue, you got there, and you played. But I mean, you're you're, you're not good. So like, the, you get years to become something approaching good in front of people. You sound like a tiger mom. And they still, <laughs> they, but they still like end up. You can still convince your friends to like show up and like support you, and then eventually, like three or four years later, when you can actually like you figure out how to make your instruments sound good and yeah. sound good as a band. It's like, but that sort of patience is, is, is cool. Yeah. But I mean, but yeah. behind every success story, they generally have a story like that, you know, like they, we went to Akron and played and it sucked. And then we did it for a long time and now we're popular. Totally. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's a, one of the steps along the way. So, um, h- harangue, harangue. Yeah. Harangatang. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so so you so you finished it was it was, was like a um I know there's the two record stores uh uh I can't remember Jerry's, Jerry's and the Attic yes and uh but they're not really it's the same as New York the, it doesn't really there's no new records it's like a used record kind of scene yeah that's a used record scene there were there were a few stores selling new stuff at the time <coughs> but it was kind of a downfall that was like a yeah w- this is a weird time yeah and uh, so were you buying music? Were you're, you're not into the boom boom so much. Yeah. At that time, I started, I was basically like, I would start listening. I had this job in like a computer lab at school. So that taught me to waste like. Yeah, with a T- endless T1 time. connection. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I would listen to WFMU a lot. Okay. And I was really into like. Uh, beats in space. Yeah, I got into beats in space. And, and that, that. um I was interested in the DJs that, like, uh, Tim was bringing on, like, like Love Fingers or, like, this, this Balearic oh, sound. The blog, blog era. Yeah, like, this Balearic kind of thing, like, seemed like a natural step. Just because it, it's still, like, it's not just machine music. A lot of times it's, like, uh, more melodic or there's, like, a live bass or some live drums on it. But uh, I remember Tim played that, like, uh, Delia and Gavin remix of or carl craig remix the of Reveille. yeah the Reveille, and that was like a big track for him that yeah. he he talks about and i think he had to talk over it um but yeah i mean i, I got into like you're like oh wait that's techno or something yeah yeah and it was it like it's not terrible yeah yeah and then like i i think like i was into like compact stuff like 
Dettinger and that sort of thing, like um, probably like Michael Mayer and that that sort of thing. And I, I was interested in um, I was interested in this because I I had started to like really start to try to find out about music, and mm -hmm. I was into like kraut rock and experimental music and this sort of thing. And I knew that there was all this dance music that I would like, but I didn't really know how to go about. Yeah, digging it, for it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you had a pretty similar path to to me. I, you know, I, I listened to a lot of indie rock and stuff. I mean, I knew about this like the throbbing gristle and can, and you know, and, uh, I'm on duel before I knew about Derek May. Likewise, or, 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 you know. So I, yeah, I, I, it sounds like a similar. I was just a little bit older than you, so had a different path. Um, like, because by the time, or n you know, whatever late '90s, I was already like, okay, I, you know, these records are cool, and boom, boom, boom. So um, it's just it sounds like it was a similar, you know, suburban white boy path or whatever, you know, like that's a, it um, or conservative family. Um, <laughs> yeah, man, you got me. You got me pegged. Not really, but we'll see. Um, so so this is you finish school. It sounds like pretty, pretty normal. And, and now you're like, OK, this boom, boom, boom thing is going on. And, and uh, I don't is that I don't remember the first time I met you. I can't. It was around that. It was l much later than that, probably 2010 or something. Yeah, something like that. So what? What you were in Pittsburgh working? Yeah, I after was school. I was working as a. I had like a job at a nonprofit, um, where we, with like this guy who was essentially a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, and um, <laughs> but we did some interesting stuff. Like we, <laughs> we made a. Um, what was his name? Oh, sorry. It was. Um, <laughs> you don't have to. But. But we made a documentary about like a civil and labor rights activist, and like I ended up getting really into like labor and union activism and this sort of stuff. So then I got a job at a law firm that would represent like, say, like uh, freight car workers that got laid off from the factory in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And and w your with your degree in, in English literature and history, they somehow let me in there. You know, <laughs> uh, like he can use punctuation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, or he can like put stuff in a binder or something <laughs> uh, but but yeah around then like 2007 i i was hanging out with this guy who makes records for sonic groove now under the name realms and he would just burn me cds and i remember one of them was like i remember that was the era where you burn cds and one of them said like old with an e old school detroit and then like one said like like classic chicago tracks and he just like gave me all these CDs, and then he's like, "Hey, we're going to Detroit to festival. go to the festival, and we're staying at the Shoreline." Maybe I met you then, maybe briefly, man, but probably not. Because you would would you stay at the? Sh I stayed at the Shoreline the first year I went. What yeah. year was that? Two thousand seven. Oh seven. Yeah, oh no, no, okay, yeah. so. But you were doing the WT party there. No, I, oh, maybe then, but no, because I, I met a, somehow the first year I went. We stayed at the short line, mm -hmm. and next door was like Sean Rudiman and and all them. But then in the same building, it was like Stinkworks and Minto, like from Down Low, mm. and uh, Convection was there too. And then, but like uh, Sean was with uh, Juwan and uh, Kurt Cox. and Kurt, and oh, yeah. I think Tom Cox, Cox was there too. And we were all just like, and somehow we like all became friends. We like realized we had been on the same forums. Oh, that's cool. And those were like Pittsburgh dudes. Yeah, man, tech tech noir audio, yeah, yeah, and, and they gave me like a tech noir promo. I was like, "Whoa, cool!" My yeah, first yeah, promo, yeah. you know. Really, that was like the I first. I don't know if it was my first yeah. promo, but it was a, it like so somebody walking at a festival give you a. Yeah, I remember like going into their room, and for some reason there was, like, this is like the, uh, the close one of the closest uh, cheap hotels to the festival. Yeah, um, I don't. And there's bullet holes in the curtains and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. But I walked into the room and there was just like a 303 sitting there for some reason. And I had like never really seen this this piece of machinery. But that year I saw like rhythm and sound. 2007. Yeah, I want to say that like, yeah, so I saw rhythm and sound mills close that one. It wasn't one of the ones that had like Snoop Dogg or, or Kraftwerk or something. No, that was that was later when they really start to <laughs> started to. They had like wacky stuff like uh, it was like Bad Boy Bill. and. Like it was before. Pa it was. Just I can't remember. I get them all mixed up. It was it was not free anymore, though. That was no. like the one that like I think the Det 
I can't remember. I don't know. I it was one of the first ones they charged money for. Yeah, yeah. yeah so because I remember. But it, it was before Paxahow charged no, money? No, Paxahow took over, I believe, that year, actually, yeah. 2007. I only know this because I interviewed them recently okay. for my... Uh, for my day job as a as oh. a music journalist, well, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but saw Moody Man, saw Rhythm and Sound, saw Mills, like like. Um, and you so the guy from you went with the dude from Sonic H- Groove. Helms. Helms Realms Realms. Realms. I don't know. Yeah. I sort of heard the name, but I didn't really. I don't. I don't it doesn't. You know, he he was just like talking to me about Drexia and stuff, and he was like a weird guy who only stayed in his house and nobody knew about him, but like <laughs> Claude Young and. Adam X like really liked his stuff, you know. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Like it wasn't like he's probably anyway. Appreciate you, Rob. If you're he, out he, there, he 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 opened the door. Yeah, he totally un- unlocked the, unlocked the door. And you know, people like Tom did too. Just like hang out with him that weekend. Tom Cox. This yeah, is, this is Pipecock. He's famous on the internet. Pipecock is a is a famous. Uh, techno internet person, a real a real purist. He was a writer for a while too. Is he still writing? Uh, no, I. He's he's got an interesting attitude about writing. I believe he said that feels too much like work. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. So 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 you get you start to get into the Pittsburgh scene, and 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 we we mentioned a couple of people. There's like, Sean Rudiman is around, and and uh, Tom Cox, and uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Juwan. Juwan. Yeah. And Kurt. And uh, yeah. Was it, he still there? Or he Kurt left Jackson. Out? I never really hung out with Kurt. Um, like Aaron Clark was starting to be around. Now he's like a big, yeah, a big deal with and the. What's uh, the other PTA guy's name? I can't. Preslov. Preslov. Yeah. Sorry. Preslov's still a, still St- a really good friend. And, and they they had yeah. this the studio there, uh, Machine Age. Yeah. Was a thing. Yeah. And then there's the, this other venue that I don't really I've n- I've never been there, but the was that a thing yet? Um, Hot Mass. Yeah. No, not yet. So basically, I was I was starting to book a lot of shows myself, like. Because I was like playing in a band, and I was just started to help other bands out and stuff, and would set up shows. And because like I'm a bit of a, uh, I was probably had like a social addiction at the time, and like would just invite people. I was good at promoting shows; like okay. I could get people out. And then like that first band broke up, and I started to play with a number of people, and we released a record and. Tom Cox came to my h- the record release show and he said he's like man I really just want to throw parties with you so he I was like why would I why would I really do that but he convinced me to start throwing things that looked more like raves with him in Pittsburgh so we had this is maybe like 2010 okay and we had that group. The first one was just like a bunch of like weird bands from Pittsburgh. And then that group Blondes from here played. Okay, I remember that. And then the second one was Beautiful Swimmers and okay. Pro- Protect You. And then the third one, which was my going away party, leaving from Pittsburgh, moving to L.A. in like 2011, was Marcellus Pittman. But at that very first party I threw, this guy came in. <coughs> and he was like, hey, I want you to... Uh, he really liked the party. It was cool. It was like all these different scenes came together, like techno kids, punk kids, noise people, whatever. And it was just in a punk house. It was a fun time. A guy came to that party and he had this like plan to throw a big festival called Via Festival. So I became involved as a booker of this festival. And we booked like the first year, like I think like one Etrix Point never played, but over the following years, like people like Moody Man like underground resistance played and it was just like uh but it's a pittsburgh festival yeah yeah, yeah I don't know. and it was like fortet like faulty dio but like rappers like big frida i think dame funk it's like whatever was like cool around that time 2010 2011 it was sort of like a risk though but who so who was this guy who was just it was uh this this guy named quinn and his partner was lauren goshinsky who's also like a dj now and people probably know her but and then Aaron Clark who does Hot Mass Mm. was there too my friend Edgar was there and this guy Paul Fleetwood who's also now a techno DJ so it was like six of us we tried to throw this like massive festival like a like a the first one was supposed to happen in 
an old brewery, but it was like there's a beer in Pittsburgh called Iron City okay. Beer, and like they said we could use the uh, their old factory, but it's like it's a huge building, but like huge pieces of concrete were falling from the ceiling and <laughs> stuff. So it was like, oh, we can't do this. So we like ended up finding a movie studio at the last minute to throw it in with like multiple stages and like a big green room and stuff. But obviously it lost money, you know, Yikes. goes goes without saying. But <laughs> it was an interesting experience. And it was like the first time I was like, oh, I guess I like booked this festival now. And like people would come from like a journalist would come from England to go to come check it out. And this or is 2011 or so. Yeah. A or 2010. So. 2010. 2010 yeah. 2011. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're still in Pittsburgh and you said you started, you mentioned that your going away party, was that before or after this festival? That was after. That was after two editions of the festival. Two editions of yeah. it. So you tried two times. What happened? Was there a third time? I think they actually threw like six or seven. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know what I'm, maybe, uh, I can't remember. It doesn't ring a bell. It might um, have been on your radar, but it was just like nobody had ever heard of Pittsburgh. And now, now people talk about Pittsburgh because they have this club there, you yeah, know. Yeah. And the people there are like pretty savvy at like getting, yeah, yeah. getting um, out there. But as, as they, well. sh- I mean, it yeah. sh- there should be more places in the states to play. You know, Pittsburgh should be one on a on a tour. You know, like, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, touring a lot recently. It, it's it's so fun to travel around the states. Yeah, like. I'm into it. It's weird, like, and, like, maybe we say that as, like, white guys who, like, can pass for driving a truck right now or something <laughs> like that. But, but like, it's nice, like, actually seeing the place where you live and understanding the makeup of your country. And, like, I get really excited when I hear about, like, Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Chattanooga, Tennessee or, yeah. like, something weird going on in Florida or Atlanta. Like, that... That stuff is cool, but I don't think the agents really understand, like, uh, what you need to do to support those communities. And I, I, I think, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't. I mean, but uh, so what? What could they do to make it better? Um, I just think that, like, I've noticed this about you, where sometimes if like the party seems cool, like you're not like you're obviously like worried about money but you have like a number of hustles and if if the party seems cool the people seem in line with the way that you think about things and you think you're going to have a good time like you might play for half of what you normally play for or something but when when you have these bigger agencies i think they they don't get it yeah yeah totally no i mean yeah so but it seems to be the solution is to not use the agents it's I mean well the problem I think the for me I s- the problem I saw is that it the way things work in the states is not the way they work in Europe. I know some some cities are trying to pretend like they do like you know you can get your Miami, your SF, maybe Chicago and your New York. But it's not the same like w- we have landed fees and you get your ass to the club yourself and then you go wherever you're going to go like and you take your money with you that's it. There's none of this like man baby like pick you up at the airport and like take you to dinner and then take you back to your hotel and then take you back to the club. It's crazy, you know, like I can't even believe it, it, it the the treatment. It's it's like a, a it's almost like offensive how 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 DJ it's like But you've never have you been uh, spoiled in that way before? Yeah, yeah it's like cr- on your European No, but I would I I I would I would rather get paid more money than be treated like that. Mm. Like I would rather like I'll I'll just handle this part myself. Yeah. Just give yeah. me the money. I'll I'll take care of it, you know? Like like I can, you know, like just the the prime th- it ends up sometimes it's really stupid, you know? It's like like in London, you know, like or or New York is the same. It's easier to take the train to the c- to the city to where you're going. Mm-hmm. It's faster, to it's cheaper. Club. Yeah. But they insist on on your agents say you must take a, a car. <laughs> and it costs, wha- I don't know what they're paying, 200 pounds or whatever it is. And then you're stuck in traffic for two hours when you could have paid 11 pounds and ri- ri- be there in 45 minutes. It's just that it, this, sorry. I'm no, I like it. Now. I, I like it. But um, in the States, it's, you're on your own, you know? I mean, but we also don't have public transportation, you know? So it's like, a, it's just, a, it's a different scene. And I think that 
there's a disconnect between the European agents and the way things work in the United States. And I don't, th I don't know if the solution is to have American bookers or to, I, I, I don't know. It's just different. And, and, and I guess by talking about it, you can try to find a solution, but so far it's been like, you know, you talk to your friends and you go play for your friends and you stay at their, at their house. Yeah. And, uh, that, that seems to be the way it works. If you really want to do it and have a good time, well, yeah, I guess if you look at, like, you you played, like, uh, like Golden Poodle and, and like... Yeah, S no, I Salon. haven't been there, like, but, but I've been to Salon, yeah. Yeah, but, but those places, like, people play for less money. Yeah, it's more American you, style. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, because it's it's cool. It's a landed deal. It's like, you know, like, oh, okay, I can give you this much money, or maybe I'll give you a little more, and you stay at this guy's house, and it's, it's fine, you know? But, uh, so, I don't know how we got distracted on this We were talking this about how... Touring how people should want to go to different American cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, so you're, you organized this VF festival a mm -hmm. couple years in a row. Yeah. And, uh, playing in bands, throwing parties with Tom. And you were appreciating that, that the small bands were coming and there was a small scene. Yeah. And you started to see how it was all working. And, um, you, so you had been in Pittsburgh working at this nonprofit organization, and the law firm and the law firm yeah. still and and then um you tried this festival and you were getting deeper into the whole uh festival techno stuff and uh you decided to make the move to los angeles is that yeah was there something before that that we missed or no it was just like uh basically pittsburgh's a great place and it taught me everything i knew no but i would go to like the same bars all the time and obviously because i was playing in a bunch of bands and booking this festival like every time I would like walk out of my house I'd run into somebody and I, I saw this future for myself and where I would like get drunk at the same bar and like kind of like book the same show in in perpetuity <laughs> and yeah. um, the woman I was dating at the time was like hey I have this opportunity to move to California um, think about it see what you want to do so I thought about it. I was like, all my friends are here. I've been to California like twice in my life. I know nothing about that at all. Do you have a driver's license? I did. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I'm just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I was like, I'm 28. If I'm gonna do, if I'm gonna move, if I'm gonna like make the plunge, like I always kind of wanted to live in New York, but I think that yeah, LA was a good choice too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I was always scared, or. I'm like a creature of habit where if if some if I'm not jolted out of my reality I I'll just like stay there where I'm comfortable and and, and that's a scary thing somehow. It is. Yeah. But so it, yeah, the yeah. older you get the the better it looks. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So you just got to realize how good it is. You go 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 screw around for a while and then get back to it. Yeah, man. But so so you end up in LA. End up in Silver Lake and like a little bungalow apartment. I was still like kind of like keeping my job at the law firm but at that point my job was to like investigate foods so i would go to the grocery store and like look at foods and see which which products claim they were all natural but actually weren't you know like i was just doing weird shit <laughs> and then uh eventually w were there any foods that yeah yeah there were tons but what did it mean though uh, dude you always pick up on the strangest details <laughs> to uh basically at the I can't even talk about this. It's too boring. No, I'm okay. I'm totally into it. Okay, so if a <laughs> if a, if a chocolate markets itself as all natural, but there's alkalized coca in the chocolate, that means that it's not technically all natural. And if I can find somebody who bought the chocolate and is willing to put their name on a lawsuit, you can sue that That's chocolate dark, company. That's dark, man. That's dark. Yeah, dude. But I, that's a weird, that's a weird path. It was odd. But I mean, d so you're, you have a boss and someone is telling you to do that. Is there, do they believe that they're, are they doing this to like be righteous? No. Or they're just looking for money? They're just looking for money. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like only in America <laughs> kind of stuff. easy like money, that. you know? Wow. Class and, th and then... Generally, it's cheaper for these large companies to settle out of court than it is to go through with the you lawsuit. Got it. Like I, my my wow. stupid my stupid trip into the 
grocery store could result in like a hundred thousand dollar settlement you know i mean that i mean that was that like it goes down to like talking to john barclay and to francois from the lot is that uh if you want to shut down a business in new york you can you just call call them call and complain about them every single day you get them shut down it's crazy like how much power you have like and then like these law oh that's terrible yeah, I'm, gl- I mean, I'm glad don't you don't do that anymore. I didn't find that terrible. You know, you, you is is that terrible in the sense that it stifles free enterprise? Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't. It, it. Uh, I don't. Ha- I don't. I'm not trying to criticize what you were doing because you're just like, oh, yeah, I don't know what I'm like, getting. Yeah. I got a job, you yeah. know. But this guy, what is he doing for society? Like, is that really? He's not trying to do it to benefit somebody he's not trying to like make this chocolate safer you know what i mean he's just like trying to like suck money out of the system and it's kind of the same as as wall street or or whatever it's like where you know what are they really doing for they're just making money out of nowhere yeah that's the classic argument against any kind of like finance or yeah 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 it's like this is not benefiting society but you could say he's keeping you can paint picture yeah yeah, yeah of yeah, course yeah, yeah. of course i'm yeah. just I'm, it's just I, I see right through it immediately yeah. you know so you it's know crazy it so you did so you 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 got up your your christian roots uh, came through and you're like this is awful i'm quitting <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> no what happened was your mother called and she was like you can't do this <laughs> tom tom cox was like <laughs> hey they told me like one of my records is up on the uh like the end rack at amoeba and I was, like, going to Amoeba and just, like, looking around. Oh, I was, like, collecting <laughs> records at the time. And the, then he was, like, yeah, you should talk to this guy, Oliver. He's, like, the buyer there. And so I went into Amoeba one night at, like, 9 p.m. because it still stays open till 11. I talked with Oliver for a while. And I was, like, hey, also, I'm, like, looking for a job. Will you will you hire me? And I forgot you worked at Amoeba. Yeah. So I got a job at Amoeba. And then my other job was there was this, like, because I had like a legal background, I, I started working for this labor lawyer who started a publication and the publication was like about unions and strikes and like workers rising up and stuff. So I started to write for this publication every single day and I would like go to like strikes at the airport and stuff and like interview people. So you're like a reporter. Yeah. So that was my first like writing job. That's pretty cool. But so yeah. and uh, so this is a, a online publication. Correct. It's like so you're a blogger. Yes. I was a like a blogger. Social justice blogger. A social justice blogger and then I do that and then I go work at Amoeba. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So those were my first jobs in LA and then I was like starting to go to warehouse parties and figure out how it all worked and stuff and, like and that. And so this is now 2013, <coughs> 14. This is 2000 11, 2012. 11 2012 yeah 2012 2012 you're in la <coughs> working at amoeba which is uh i mean ev- i guess everybody that's ever been to california has been to amoeba yeah either in yeah a, uh, berkeley san francisco or los angeles or la right there in hollywood you know thrown thrown right into it amongst the glitz and glamour but that, that's like a, a that's one of those places that it's like pretty good to work with at you know like beacon's closet or whole foods they give you benefits and it's california you get no like man i made like 12 bucks an hour but they didn't give you yeah, health insurance no no, no. but well i was too also too part late too part late time. yeah i was too late yeah because yeah. I, kn- I know in san francisco I, I, when i lived in san francisco in the 90s the people that worked at amoeba i think it was a pretty good oh, job that's cool yeah, yeah. yeah like it's a liberal environment yeah yeah like um i got i got tons of records did you pay for them? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, because oh, they, they got the stealing d- like on lockdown. Yeah, you're not, you're not getting a record out of there. No. You ha- what was the employee discount? I'm curious. I think it was like thirty percent on used. Thirty percent on used. Twenty percent on new. Did you? But did you get to like you like mark them? You like mark that record cheap? Uh, sometimes there were some schemes. There going were on. there was like a, there yeah there once in a while. I mean, Amoeba's weird in that. At the time, there was so much volume going through where you could get, like, a ton of records that are, like, $50 records I was getting for, like, $3 or yeah, something yeah. at the at the time. And I think that when it opened, it was even more yeah. like that. I'm sure that 2000s. that's kind of the typical record uh, c- <coughs> culture. Yeah, I don't, like the, I don't like when people talk about a record they bought and they're like, 
yeah, I got this for five dollars, you know. I'm like, yeah, boy, you t- how much scheming did you do to get it for five dollars? <laughs> <laughs> so you so you're at Amoeba, but Amoeba in Los Angeles. I don't. It's, it's a weird store to me. I don't. I'm not. There's no listening stations. Yeah. It's for me. It's really like been a deal breaker since. I mean, when I was in San Francisco, I was like, okay, I'll just go to Open Mind because I can listen to it. And and it's weird. I, <coughs> did, did they? Maybe there was like CD listening stations at one point. You have a really good memory. But uh, they were there were like CD scanning listening stations where you could scan it and listen to like through some weird internal network and you know you can go in there and like what i do is i just go in with like earbuds in and listen to youtube yeah, but that's fucking takes forever yeah man it oh. does but uh, when i work there but I that's one of the weird things where records are faster like skipping you can yeah. skip through a fuck you know yeah that's true that's like a that that is a weird thing where where like analog is faster still yeah you can, you know, you can just put the thing on. I can listen to the record faster than you can pull it up on YouTube. Yeah, you know, like totally. I don't know. Well, sorry. All right, that's my amoeba complaint. I, I'm gonna put it out there every time. And that, ta- and that tape. Why they tape it so much, man? That's annoying. And like, then you just, I just cut the jacket, the plate. It's, I end up cutting it off. You can't peel <laughs> that stuff off. You guys, listen up. Come on. But they're not gonna change. You know, I don't. I mean, I, I feel like it goes back to like Berkeley. You know, and like people were like stealing records, <laughs> like, and they like kept the policy. They like never changed. They came know? up with a way to make it almost impossible to open the record without slicing the jacket. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so y- so you worked <laughs> you worked at Amoeba and you worked at this other weird reporter. That's your yeah. your writing job. Yes. And um. 2012. Yeah. In Los Angeles, California, yeah. living in Silver Lake. I'm still pretty naive. Is at there? That time. I mean, is a uh, was Mount Analog open yet? Or no, it Mount just opened. Mount Analog opened, I think, in 2014. So what? I don't remember what the scene. I mean, when I go, I, I went there a couple times, and we would like play it, the Echo or like some weird. I don't know. And then there was like a weird lull, and then all of a sudden it was like downtown rave warehouse parties. Mm-hmm. I I don't know when exactly that started. There were there were a couple things going on. I remember like two weeks after moving to town, I kind of found Dub Lab and started listening to shows. Oh and, yeah. then, and then uh, Paul T and the Harvey Sarcastic Disco yeah, that's been parties there. were huge. Like yeah. I remember a week after arriving, there was a party, a Harvey party, and I couldn't find the address. There was an info line, but they wouldn't give I it to you. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't find it. So that was like, oh, okay, I'm in a new place. I don't know shit. Um, but yeah, at that party they could announce it like a week out, and like fifteen hundred w- people would show up at some odd warehouse. Um, there was like a place called Music for Dancers, which was like kind of based off of like Klipsch, like loft style, like really long sets, like all night stuff. I would go there a lot when I moved to town, and then and then I and then I was like, well, I threw parties in Pittsburgh. I put together a festival in Pittsburgh. I'm I'm gonna like start throwing a party here. So I got together with like a few people and uh we planned our first warehouse party and we had a uh, Andres from Detroit play and uh Delroy Edwards play. H- his record had just come out on Lies, I think. That was 2012 early 2013. Um but yeah, he lived in town and it was good cuz I like met everybody who was buying records at the record store yeah. and stuff. But then, uh, yeah, I promoted this party and like we sold like a hundred tickets in advance, and all these people were going to come, and then it got shut down. Oh. Like, uh, and so we managed to like move the party. Like the Vice Squad came and they they lectured me and they spoke with me, and then we managed to move the party to an alternate, super grimy location, <laughs> and Brandon Delroy and. Andre still played and it still went off, but like we lost some money on that party. But it was like a real, it was, t- it was a real trial by fire, you know, because yeah. like uh, there's a lot. I mean, I feel like a lot of those <coughs> from I d- I'm not from L.A. I've only yeah. played a few of those parties, but I've noticed that those security guards are cops. Like for sure, like every security guard at those rave parties <coughs> is, a f- is a cop. They're they're either a cop or they're a like a criminal. Cop. Yeah. Yeah. Like one or the other. Yeah, people have some issues with that. Like it, no, it's I like don't. Yeah. I, I just but so you either need to 
have the in on with the cop or the in with the criminal circuit. I mean, I, me- I remember one like w- I played with, with like Junior and those guys. Um, oh yeah, and uh, was that like I don't know what Sunny Side uh, Up or some weird place like on like in Fifth Street or yeah. some sports bar or something. Oh, it was but the, yeah, Sunny Side Up. Yeah, and the it was Five Star Bar. Five Star Bar, I think that's what it was. <coughs> and like the security guard definitely like had a gun on him and and was like. Those guys have an interesting thing. More yeah, but that yeah. was one of the best parties I've ever played in L.A. Like, yeah, I mean that that party is sick. Yeah, like uh, those guys are because they're they, but they have a real history and roots, and they kind of oh, yeah. don't really change with the trends. They're just doing their thing. You well, know? they don't charge over ten dollars, yeah. and they they had a weird thing worked out with the five star bar where they could just lock the door. Yeah, that's what happened. And like you just play all night. Um, they all have crazy collections. Yeah, I um, I thought it was really cool because like, I didn't I don't even remember who hooked me up. I can't remember who, how I got. Oh, uh, was it Andrew? No, um, uh, Dan, uh, Dan. Uh, oh my God, I can't remember. Dan is his name, but uh, Vietnamese guy. Dewey. No. Dan. No. Oh, I've you're you're thinking of Quan. Quan Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quan yeah. Dam. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. He, he he told me he's like play for these guys. And uh, I was like, okay. And then I get there, and they're, like, dressed like the Lost Boys. You know, they're wearing, like, overcoats and, like, sunglasses and, like, 90s. like, And this is, like, whatever, 2013 or 12, same time kind of. And I was like, what is going on? And then you go up, and it's, like, full sound system with, like, rotary mixers. And, like, you're like, all right, this is cool. And then they were like, man, you sound like Danny Teneglia. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> is that a compliment? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, or I, d- I didn't even know. It was like just some other, they were, it was a cool, that's what I really like about LA. And it's cool that you went there and entered <coughs> this scene. You know, it's such a, it's like a um, fantasy land. I mean, I don't it's even. It's weird. It's a weird place, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like, um, just even the places where they throw parties, it's, it's odd. Like, how do you navigate that? Um and like nobody cares like nobody everybody's like got it good like even if you're dirt poor and like live in a shitty apartment your life is still pretty easy you can still like eat organic avocados and juice you know or like your quality of life is high it's it's funny because like one time i went to a party with kwan and i uh i think he might have imbibed in something that (laughs) night but no way we we gave him a ride he's great yeah he's great he's like knows about and he and he was sitting on the couch where I lived with my ex-girlfriend and, and she was like, is he going to bed? What's he doing? And he was just sitting out on the couch on the futon <laughs> listening to one of your tracks. <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. And he was just like, he was just having a party, party for one, man. He's great. He's a good dude. Yeah, he's good. But he like, I don't know, he's one of those people that kind of like hooked me up. He just was like, dude, he's a go, fan, man. go here, go hook up with this dude and like. Yeah, but that's the thing. That's what you need to know about LA, like where at at least at that time you you had to like have a connect to somebody or like something like that or yeah. um and yeah like you could play a warehouse party that's the best party of your life or you can play one that that's somewhat not very memorable um yeah, yeah but we ended up throwing 12 more of those parties so we we eventually like and figured what, what it was out. the name of it that was called states of being states of being yeah we had like a but at the time, it was a little I- bit easier. Like, we had, like, Prosumer's first show in L.A., Cassim Mose's first performance in L.A. Because Pe- uh, people weren't really going. L.A. Yeah. wasn't really a thing yeah. th- yet. Now it is. Yeah. Now, now like, I wouldn't even know what to book. And then Mount Analog came in, and they booked you and Bo and Trax and yeah. Veronica and, like, all these people, like they were booking like dream record store nerd lineups in warehouses, like hieroglyphic being playing back records backwards at <laughs> two three a.m. and yeah, yeah. Then it just went crazy, you know. So that that was a good good time period for LA. It was pretty free, and it was it was also kind of a new. That t- I mean, I don't. I mean, uh, you see the things, and you say that you know these people like Junior and the Harvey, like the rave thing was there, but. This was like a new, a new era, kind of. I don't. I, th- there's no name for it, you know. Like before, you had like Electro Clash or the, you know, House or whatever techno. Now and there's like not really a. 
a name for what was going on now, but this like Mount Analog and what you were doing, there was like a scene. And but the cool thing is, is it was pretty open because like even things like uh, Brian Shimkowitz, like Awesome Taste from Africa, was kind of around, and this was you know a little bit different, but he was accepted. And then I remember seeing people like um, Stephen Warwick, what's his thing called? Uh, Heat Sick. Heat Sick would come around, and this the art people would start coming. Yeah. And then people like uh, Eddie Riche, like R- Secret Circuit, and uh, like Tom of England, and those guys. Little, and then even art kind of guys and Dub Lab guys. It was a cool scene. It was a good mix. Yeah. You know, and there would be like you know the gangsters from the neighborhood would show up and you know sell some drugs, whatever. But it was a cool time. Um. And 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 so you you kind of coast coasted. You did your your LA you coasted for a while. Yeah, man. I was I was in there. Uh, the the labor lawyer eventually got tired of pouring money into that weird publication I worked for. So then uh, our friend Brian Foote asked if I wanted to start helping him out, like running some labels, doing some PR. I should have him on the podcast. Oh, he'd be terrific. He's got that guy. He's probably got some stories. good stories. Yeah. He's got this one story about uh, well, I, I'll let Bri- him Brian know. Brian Foot. He just I just saw he just put out an LP today. LP is announced L- today. Leech. That's that's Leech. L e e c h. Yeah. Shout out to Leech. When we we threw a party at his at his loft where you met him. Oh, that's right. Yeah, like we had a Fit Seagull. He used to live in. Yeah, he didn't always live in Highland Park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Glassell Park. Glassell. Sorry, yeah, sorry. We, sorry. we had a Fit Seagull and Bookworms play his uh his loft yeah yeah that was a fun one i forgot about that but uh, yeah so you started brian foot hello brian yeah um you started working for him doing pr and my first job was to uh look up any music journalist or editor that i knew so, so he, but but so a little background on brian foot he's the label manager for cranky yeah and he also does some pr on the side for stuff yeah mostly like experimental or dance acts and he and he runs like a sort of boutique label with uh our friend brian, brian brianz and brian paul called peak oil you know his real last name i sure do <laughs> should we should we say it here sutherland Ooh, dude <laughs> sorry Hi, brian. shots fired yeah i love it um, does it did his wife take his la- or did they get married they got married man. does it, does she have his last name i don't know is she a sutherland I don't think she <laughs> I'm going to ask. I don't think she is. Um, yeah, but basically, to give you a little bra- background, <laughs> Brian Brian's a guy from Wisconsin. He was a skater turned like R- raver, turned raver, turned like kind of he wanted to be like kind of like the Happy Mondays and have like a shoegaze band. Playing but Wisconsin, at the rave. The Wisconsin at the time had this like drop bass network yeah. scene, which is pretty heady, serious. Yeah. And it's also, but it's also this weird scene, like, you go to DMF and you, you see all these, like, white techno dudes from Iowa. Yeah. It's that scene, and they know every single techno record, like, they know way more than anybody ever. It's crazy. Yeah. And, like, that's that's where, what, Wisconsin, Wisconsin? Or yeah, Minneapolis, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it's, I can't imagine, in the 90s, Wisconsin. Tech. Yeah, I think Minneapolis was involved, too. But it's not what you yeah. think of when you think of techno, you know, but <laughs> but it was huge there, or not huge, but there was a definitely an, an informed scene. Yeah, know? I mean, there were records coming out, too, like the Woody McBride and, like, stuff like that. Yeah, like Adam, Adam X was on there, too. Yeah, yeah. He had record on Drop Bass Network. Yeah. But yeah, Brian came out of this. He moved to Chicago, started working for Cranky, legendary ambient-leaning label, experimental label, uh, moved to L.A. Le Bradford. We bonded over, like, yeah, we bonded over liking uh, Moody Man and stuff like that. He brought me in. I hit up all these people that I used to know. Um, I hit well, up this wait, guy. Who, 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 what, you, you told me before, but I forgot. Now, you were looking up every single label owner, you said? or No, any any music journalist. Journalist. I and okay. so when I, when I uh, through the festival, like, journalists from, like, Dummy and Dazed came to cover the festival in Pittsburgh. So on my first visit to Europe, which was in 2012, I, like, l- looked them up and met up with some of them. And so these were some th- – that's, like, the only people that I knew. So yeah. I hit them up. And I hit up this guy, Charlie, who was editing the magazine Dazed at the time. Okay. And I said, hey, man, here's, I'm working for Cranky now. Here's some releases. And then, and then just as an aside, I was like, by the way, I've been writing about labor 
and workers' rights for the past couple of years. And then he was like, hey, why don't you write something about labor for the magazine? And, and so I wrote about weed dispensary workers organizing. And then I wrote about a uh, worker-owned peep show in San Francisco that was closing down. So kind of these like quirky like labor stories that oh, would yeah, work for a cool like magazine. Vice, Vice magazine yeah, era. Vice, yeah, yeah, exactly. So those were my first two like real published pieces. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Did you get paid? No. Oh, per sounds about right. No, I, they they owed me money, but I was like too cowed. You're like, to, like there was an error. There was an error on the invoice or something. <laughs> they just stopped responding to my emails, you know. Oh, but uh, but Charlie's great anyway. I don't. It was like it's fine. Yeah. yeah. You're water under the bridge. Yeah, it's cool. Um, <laughs> I don't need the twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, but so but this is this is so this this part is is why I do this podcast is like, you know, like we like music and uh, there's a. I want people listening, you know, like younger people hopefully will listen at some point in history because the Internet is forever and see the path to get to these places where you you can participate in the music industry and make a living. You know, like this is your first published story, you know, like cool, you know, like maybe your mom doesn't quite see it yet. But but looking back, maybe in 10 years, she'll 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 realize that, oh, you're OK. And this was a, a moment for you. Like oh, I can be a journalist. Yeah, and uh, um, even though you know journalism is a, <laughs> I don't even know how you get paid anymore. You just like write invoices to somebody, <laughs> and hopefully you get paid. I don't know. <gasps> and uh, um, so so you start writing for days. To, did this become a regular thing now, or or this just was kind of like a resume builder? Uh, I wrote a couple things for them, and then it was odd. Like it was when that vice vertical their dance music vertical thump was around and somebody brought it to my attention that they were looking for writers. So I started writing for them and I wrote a, f a few pieces for them. And then I started writing for accelerator just like very naturally, but I still had no idea to get back to your point. I had no idea how writing pieces for between 50 and $300 would ever <laughs> pay my rent. Yeah. But I was like, this is enjoyable. Yeah. And then but you seem like you'd like to meet people. You're yeah. you're, and you're also genuine. You you don't like the conversation to end, so you tend to keep asking questions. Yeah, totally. So so that's a, it, it suits you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like it was interesting. It was it was also like nice to like support little labels and yeah, like uh, like write about them in these places. And uh, I could always write. Um, and then, yeah, so. The way I started working for RA was one day I was at Amoeba <laughs> and DJ Quick came in and I wouldn't even know what he looks like. Yeah, I didn't either actually. Somebody else was like that. I didn't DJ. I didn't recognize him yeah. immediately. And he came up and he was showing me a d he I was ringing him out at the register and he was showing me a Delphonics record that he had bought for like $2 and it was warped and he was explaining to me how you can put a record in the oven yeah. and sounds like a real record digger <laughs> <laughs> i've I definitely done that too yeah and i was like i was like uh yeah so what are you what are you doing in the neighborhood i was always make conversation because i like to talk to people like yeah. you said yeah. and ask some questions yeah. and he's like yeah my studio's around the corner and i was like uh oh yeah like uh who do you work with and he's like oh you know like right now i'm working with debarge and like <laughs> and i was like who is this person and like and so he left and then the next guy comes up and I, I re somebody tells me they're like that was just dj who quick. was tailing dj quick. yeah the, like the next guy comes up and i'm like hey dj quick was actually just here because i think he was buying a dj quick cd it was my friend and it was a guy named zed and he just he was just so excited about my dj quick story and he's like what's the address <laughs> yeah and then, but he came back up and he's he had a friend with him and he's like, tell my friend your DJ quick story. Like he was that excited about it. And then he was buying records. We started to talk and then we were starting to talk about music. And then he's like, yeah, I'm a professor at the new school in New York and I'm just out here for the summer. I come out to LA for the summer. And then we, we were, I was pretty new to LA at the time still. And he's like, uh, I was like, 
it's like, yeah, do you want to hang out? You want to like get a drink or something like that? So we got a drink and we like bonded over like Nile Rogers and just like random shit we were into. And then a former student of his worked for RA and gave him. Who was that? It's this woman named Donnell who's a booking agent now. But she she gave him uh, that DJ Sprinkles double that mix that he did like when dance floors st- stand still yeah it has like Braxton Holmes and like I it's, mi- I can't, it's, it's like a good mix it's I like I real deep I don't know I don't get I don't get it sorry you would like the you like these tunes it was like he's in Tronics ensemble like Calypso of house and like I don't know any of that you know that I, I, I always try to I like I really like the idea of DJ sprinkles and I try to listen to it but um, I kind of instantly forget what it sounds like uh, it's one of those weird so things it, it like just it washes over it goes it. right through yeah me. i don't know it's like a it's like a fortet or something <laughs> <laughs> but she was Sorry. but All but right. no but my friend zed who i'm staying with in new york now we're like really close friends from like that one dj quick <laughs> thing at the register oh, geez. yeah he uh he was like hey my old student Donnell, she's talking about the same stuff as you. Like you guys should meet up. So Donnell came over one night with like a bottle of champagne. We hit it off, and the next day she's like, "Hey, you should start writing for RA." And I wrote a review. I think I reviewed uh, the House of Doors twelve inch on Mood Hut, which basically sounds like a New York house record. Mm-hmm. And I remember the editor sent it back three times, <laughs> saying like that my review sucked <laughs> and I needed to uh to fix it so I was like this is never going to work out I don't I don't see how this is the case well, but if they're putting the effort in to send it three times there must yeah. be some uh, yeah I guess th- that's it that's exactly it if it was like so bad they wouldn't yeah, yeah. if it was like totally uh but what what what, what was their criticism of it too long or, or not I think that here's something that I think applies to like writing and art in general where you know when you like develop some skill and you're really um, eager to show it off, like where a little too big of words or something. You got it. Flowery. Or What's the musical equivalent? Would you say a solos? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a solos fun here and there. A side chain compression. Yeah, thing. yeah. There you go. So you so just tricks do and li- too many tricks. Yeah, we're 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 asked the real masterful stuff is 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 uh you don't being able to be eloquent but concise yeah, you know? it, it, it is a little annoying when you read a review and you're like this guy uses a thesaurus you know or like you know like a maybe they just know those words yeah i know but i mean that's not that's not how the thinking works you know yeah it's yeah the cycle's not that deep i mean it, it should be but it's not um so so you you got a job at all right this but this is this freelance still no, it's just like Putting in a review even. once in a while. And then I, here's here's the hustle part. This is the only part of this story that doesn't involve just some random element of chance. I was still doing PR, and I was doing PR for the label 100% Silk. And, and, but but is, there, is there a weird, is there, is there a, some, it seems like those two are, is there a conflict of interest between those two? In that case, I was, like, writing, I had written, like, just, like, a handful of reviews. And okay. there is a conflict of interest, but I was, and that's something that I still navigate to this day. Yeah. But in that instance, I would just never review anything that I had anything to do with pr- professionally. I wouldn't, and I was only, like, reviewing, like, a random record here and there. And yeah. I was reviewing regularly for Accelerator as well. Um, so at the time, actually, my jobs were, I was working at Amoeba 25 hours a week. And I was working in with Brian Foote 25 hours a week. And then I had a regular job at Amoeba as well. And then I went to South by Southwest uh, because we were participating in a showcase and because I knew all the RA people would be there. And I knew they were trying to expand in the U.S. So I was like, oh, I should just like go down and meet them or whatever so uh, so just a little so we keep talking about ra this is resident advisor dot net yeah and, it, and it's a ticket sales company yeah when it, it comes down to it they it's, it's they an electronic music magazine no it's not they <laughs> they they sell tickets on the internet and uh and it's disguised as a 
electronic music magazine. It's still a magazine. There's they do put content up every day and I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. But the way they make their money is they take a dollar off every ticket sold through their website. That's it's correct. It's very genius because it's totally, if you don't think about it, you don't even notice. Totally. But but you were, so, yeah. I was saying, uh, resi- you, you were defining resident advisor and I was saying it's a electronic music magazine and you're saying it's a ticketing website. And I think the answer is it's both, you know, obviously. But I mean, the... B- the I didn't I, I, I didn't have any idea I, I had um I went to London one time and I'm and the Australian guy's name is Aaron Coltate. Aaron Coltate sorry Aaron um I went to go meet him because I had a good he always seemed like a nice guy and he wrote a nice feature on you and uh he I don't know it was before that or after that I can't remember now and uh I just wanted to see the RA office and I was like I went there and I was like man this is nice and I was like how did how, how does this pay for it? And he was like tickets, and I was like the oh oh all right all right all right, now I get it. And like because I I'd, I've never bought a ticket on RA ever in my life. I w- if I have to buy a ticket, I won't even go. You know. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's the last ticket that you bought in general? I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, like probably like Drake or something. Drake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I can't. I really can't remember um no i paid for we paid to go to a uh, uh, magic city we paid to go to the weird science party oh that's cool because it's like a, a community yeah thing and uh yeah when d- when doug uh, when ann i was here we, we oh paid, nice uh, ten dollars each um sp- big, sorry big spender yeah I, I i don't i don't know uh, i feel like i work there yeah so no you understood. shouldn't have to pay yeah to work i get there, it you know? Um, so, so yeah, y- you got this job at resident advisor and I just started, uh, dogging it because I'm a jerk, but no, 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 but it, I think it's a great, it, it, it's people use it and it's a useful thing. And, uh, it, it, it there's a community to it. I, w- I was a little upset when we lost the comments and the forum and stuff like that. But, uh, was that, did you, did, was there still forum when you worked there? No, the forum was done away with at that time. And I was, I was there for. Most of, well, first of all, I became like a part-time news writer, mm-hmm. and and so I was just writing news and writing occasional reviews, and then I got a full-time offer from RA. And, and did they make you quit the other jobs? Or t- your I did quit the other jobs at that point, but at some it point... It was unspoken, though, just kind of like, you just, you work for RA now. Um, It's kind of complicated, actually. Like, at basically, at some point, I was working part-time for RA, working at Amoeba, and doing PR, and doing various freelance things. So I was probably like on the clock like 80 hours a week or yeah, something. Yeah. And and then um, RA made me a full-time offer. I just couldn't couldn't keep it up, essentially. And and yeah, in, in retrospect, it's like you can't do PR and no. be a full-time music journalist. That's just not going to work. No, it's a, so yeah. somebody's going to get mad at you somewhere, you know. Somebody's always going to be mad at you. Yeah, well, th- like but but that's one of those things you're not doing it right if if somebody's if, if you don't have haters or or whatever the rap language is. I think um, that's true. I mean, to be honest, my number the only things I like actually feel bad about at RA are when there's a label that I believe in or, or an artist that I believe in that I fully intend to support. And that I even tell that I'm going to do something for and I don't come through with that. And yeah. that's only happened like under that's happened like two times that but I can think of. What yeah. are you going to do? You yeah. know, you can yeah. only you d- as long as you're, you're you're honest about stuff. I think it's it's uh, it's OK. Um, so I don't know. I mean, this is uh, there's a whole can of worms that we could talk about, you know, like because you are a music journalist and uh i don't know where to begin or or what to start with it's it's kind of like a a, a it, there's so many like taboo subjects you know and, and and so many things that we're we're not even allowed to talk about just go in man i don't i, I really i don't know where to start you know um <laughs> well it, it's it's a it, you know you even even from the time you started which what do you said is 2000 uh, 14. 14 until now, 2019, um, things have changed, you know, like, uh, uh, um, the internet, even just from something like, you know, you would have, 
let's just start we'll start with the uh, there was there was a forum and uh, and a community and uh it was taken away and then uh the then after that you know you would have a review or you would have a news story and there would always be comments you know and 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 that was taken away and uh, i don't know what year that happened but that seemed like a really weird thing to me that was and, I, and I, what were you there yes. for the discussion of that or I believe that was 2017 and maybe ended 2017. Well, it was just too much trouble to keep up with. No, it actually, it was 2000. It was last year. It was yeah, 2018. It was yeah. Um, if you look at a review from 2012, <laughs> I don't know why you would necessarily do that. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're curious well, about people read the Internet. What's like a good record that came out in 2012? I don't know. Lindstrom. I OK, don't know. like. You look at a record of like I a uh, review of I feel space and on R A and there will be twenty seven comments under it. And a there lot was of a voting system also. Yeah, an upvote, downvote. And like Reddit. And many, and many of the comments will be like Oh, I love this new Norwegian sound, like this is great and then somebody else will be but like But the PR guy wrote that. Yeah, and then and then <laughs> I love this new Norwegian sound. But then somebody w else will be like, oh, cool, like space disco. Like that's and like that's not cool. Like Boring. that's that's been done. Like, yeah. yeah, like Patrick Adams plus Italo disco. Like that's mm. not cool at all. Like it's more of like a spirited exchange of ideas at that time. And then you fast forward to 2017 and it's like only just stands who are just like, what, best poke, poke. best RA article ever. Thank you so much for posting this. And then the other half is just like just trolls. I was poke the panda, poke the panda. You were? Well, no, no, wasn't that one of the? I I remember Pro Angel Wings. He oh, was Pro like, Angel yeah, Wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like the most famous troll. But it was just only trolls. I think all the trolls are are um are uh, Jexopolis. <laughs> He loves the uh, RA comments I've heard, but but it, the the what I'm saying is that the level the dialogue just um, diminished and went to it went from being something more akin to the message boards that you posted on growing up, where it was like a lively sort of comical exchange about music, to just being more along the lines of like a YouTube comment or something like that, and. I think that they couldn't justify that, especially you you see like the shit that like Boiler Room is getting for comments <laughs> these days and stuff like that, where it's just like if you if you especially like if you leave like people out there to be abused by random strangers on the Internet, there's only so much. Uh, there's only so much that. But I don't time that you can but do that. Uh, but. My point, er, just to, I'll play the other side of the argument. Yeah. Even if I don't truly believe it, but maybe I do, is that if you can't take that, then you shouldn't be an artist. Like you're. It's like what you learn when you go to art school is like how to take criticism. You're like saying if you can't take take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if. if so, but yeah, but the thing so is. So what? Like, so what? The sticks and stones may break my bones. I don't oh, know. I I don't agree when. Like, I'll just say this. There have been times when comments are moderated because they're negative. Yeah. And I don't think that they cross over into the line of harassment. Yeah. And they've been, like, deleted. And I, th I, d I don't agree with that. Yeah. Like, you should be able to take... And there is so much glad-handing yeah. in today's, like, social media well, yeah, world. Yeah, I mean, this is... I mean, it's the huge comment now with, the, you know, like, with Twitter is, like, what what is the line to where you can moderate or not and i guess that's the line they decided was that we're just not going to mess with this and get rid of it no but i i do think that if if i'm saying like um that dx line sounds like garbage and you don't know how to program drums that's one thing but if i'm saying like oh who is peggy goo's ghost producer then that's like that's like a different nature of comment. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm not sure if they're yeah. different. Really? Yeah, because I, I, I don't know. Like, I, it, there's no. The problem is, 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 
you have to define it and you can't you know so it like what what is it i don't know like just because it hurts somebody's feelings or i don't know it's it's a it, it, but i get maybe that is the right decision by talking to you is to to not have it you know like that way you don't even have to think about this you know like because it, it you know you have like this this twitter ceo guy is going on every i can't remember his name he's going on every Jack. yeah he's going on like every single podcast like talking about this this thing like a uh, comments or or what to who to be censored and what is hate speech and all this stuff and and you know these 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 seem like pretty smart people and they're successful and they have a lot of time to think about this and they've seen it grow too you know so and i don't think they know what to do with it either you know yeah and and, and their whole content is so other people's speech and and people like ra you know you at least you have you have ticket sales and you have articles so you don't need that part of it i guess it's a, it's a it, you know you're you're taking out the social media aspect i mean maybe maybe it was as simple as that like um paying somebody to moderate these comments yeah that's a <laughs> like that's bleak. that's dark you know what i mean Oof. like imagine showing up every day but that's why it's like you know the the other choice would be to just leave them up and people are like you know and then and then then i would say there you get into this weird argument where like people should you know you should not be able to be on the internet anonymously it's like you you got to own that comment if you're going to put it down you know like we know you're a jackass you know like I mean, uh, these are these are like weird, like, you know, Republican versus Democrat, conservative, liberal. You know, like, I think you can break it down to these kind of viewpoints. You you can like uh, rank these categories by political affiliation, do you think? I think you can start to. I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean it, it pol- a, f- a philosophical or political or whatever, you know, you can start to. I, I'm not I don't know that much about uh, uh, philosophy. But as you know, there's these you know certain things like where you're, you have this idea where like, you should do what's best for yourself, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. you should do what's best for everyone, and you know like the argument is is if everybody does what's best for themselves, like this like Anne Rand weird mm-hmm. conservative, then yeah. it should be what's best for everyone else. Yeah. But then you know the people that say we should do what's good for everybody else is it, it's different. You know, there's a yeah the utilitarian idea, the greater good. Yeah, I don't and I, like. And th- these have been these philosophical discussions for a really long time. Yeah. And, and you know, since the Internet is soon so new, it's not quite clear how it works yet. You know, like and then so I, I it might have been a good decision for R.A. to just just content only like wha- who, who gives a shit what this uh, broken angel wings or <laughs> I can't remember what his name was now. Pro angel pro wings. angel wings like who cares what they say, you know, like why does their opinion matter but then why does anybody's opinion matter so it's uh, yeah i mean i think what it came down to is like women specifically whether they were female artists or female readers of the site felt unfairly targeted by trolls in the comments section and the decision was made uh to make uh women non-binary people trans people like feel more comfortable on the site but when I was what I was saying at the beginning is just the level of dialogue was not maybe one out of every fifteen comments was like interesting. The one the one thing that you the one thing that you lose when you do away with comments is the ability for users to give feedback immediately that's actually honest. Like no. uh you missed this. You said it was their second twelve inch, it's actually their seventh and or you whether it's fact checking or whether it's just like this article sucks <laughs> like why why is this uh like what what is your point with like posting this article and that and that's something that i think is is it is genuinely all right it's a shame to, to lose that yeah that, that interesting i was going to switch to to something even more taboo but i'm not okay let's to. do it i'm not going to do I it. I decided. No, no, no. I, I, I got to be careful. I, the wine is flowing. You know. All right. Let me get some more wine. Um. <laughs> Whoa. So, so just a, a, a I'm gonna. Sw- this is a general uh, a journalism review question. Mm-hmm. Is a uh, um, that, that, 
just a question that maybe that I have. I don't know if it's a, a, a maybe it's not general, but uh, um, is a, a when you write about stuff, um, do you try to stay with stuff you like, or is is there? Or so I guess maybe the question should be. Is is there a point to to having a negative review or, or or writing about saying stuff sucks? Like it's like my grandma say, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Is is this some a, a journalism a journalism like standard thing, or or do you follow it, or is it part of the ethos? I I think that for the most part, I'm looking for interesting music that I like that maybe not everybody knows about in order to give it some attention. However, um, the way that it typically works at RA is if it's a, if it's the first release on WT records and it, there's a, it's a 200 press 12 inch and I don't, I'm not crazy about it. First of all, these days, it's difficult to get a review like that run because it just people aren't like reading the single reviews a lot in it's terms. It's probably the only thing I read. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're like most people read the LP reviews or the features or something like that. But, but we sort of like have this thing internally where if it's like a fledgling label from uh, like Nashville or something, and just like slamming the record just isn't the coolest thing to do <laughs> you know like just because it's you know it's expensive to put out a record and um maybe they'll get it right on the second one you know? and our job is to like support scenes not not like be like some weird disembodied but like but is there a, if, is there ever a reason to say like this record is a you know you have a system in one what one to four one to five one to five and is there ever a reason to write a review about a 1.0 record yeah if it's by like somebody who is getting paid like five to ten thousand euros like to Sven DJ Bach every night. puts yeah, out yeah, a record yeah. And, and, and you're gonna review it and be like this is terrible yeah and what, what I, do you don't think that it would be better to have the space for something that you like um well, I mean, I guess it's, it's in the end, it's a business. So you want people to read it and people like to read that stuff sometimes, I guess. I think that one of the most like read reviews on the site in the last six months, the most read review on the site was a negative review. What was it? Uh, the Apparat LP. And what is that? It's a compact? Yeah, like technology? related. Like it's it's sort of like long. it's like electronic woozy electronic pop like kind of like more music or something like that okay. um but yeah the reviewer just didn't like it but they did a very clever <laughs> job shutting it down and that w that was like the most read review on the site probably like the artist reading it over and over <laughs> <laughs> but is there how, how detailed are the analytics is it is it like by ip address or, or is it like is it it's by individual user yeah yeah, yeah. it's pretty serious i mean and and uh, who who's is who's looking at is there like a, a, a is there a whole another part of RA that's looking at that or is it just the writers or is it's it just, just the writers there's not like a separate like data there's or there's like analytics. a web a webmaster and he's or she is sending you no I can look at it you can look at yeah, it whenever yeah. you want mm -hmm. yeah and what 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 is the what was the like, I'm gonna go through some questions yeah that. sure so what was the most popular the video you make these video uh things in the past couple of years whenever it doesn't have to whatever time period like which one was the most popular actually it was like one that i, I don't want to like toot my own horn but it was the one los angeles one the real things los angeles was popular but the most popular one was like a really short piece of content that i wrote which was how larry heard made house deep oh well larry heard is the 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 king of it, it all. It also says like Deep House in the title. In it's the just hashtag. a U it's a YouTube friendly title. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, to Ari's credit, for many years I just reviewed whatever the fuck I wanted, and I was able to do that. Yeah. Only. Only recently has it been a little more like, well, who's going to read that? Are you sure? Like, 
I have to like make a case for it. If if well, it's there's a, there's a lot of stuff right now. There's there's a, a ton of stuff. There's there needs to be some filter and and yeah, but it's it's hard too because there then there's this like anti gatekeeper thing. So you have to like pretend that you're not a gatekeeper, but you are. So it's like uh, it's a hard, hard, hard way to hard time, you know. I mean, it might be good to ask these questions. You you're know, you're a gatekeeper. You're a DJ. You're, that means well, like I don't play very much. <laughs> <laughs> but you play. You play every week. No, nah, it's not about me, man. No, <laughs> no I'm I, no, no, not not really. I play like once a month now. But you play every week in public, at least on the radio. On the radio, I yeah, do yeah, radio yeah. every week. Yeah. But that's that's totally uh it's not I just play records that I stole from my work <laughs> every week. <laughs> but if you were forced to play new records, then you would be a, a gatekeeper. I played all new USB stick this week. Yeah. All promos. So you know, there you go and you were a gatekeeper in that instance. Yeah, a filter. Yeah. Is, is, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the best you can hope for, especially in an instance where most people can listen to the music. So so uh, so we need to change that thing that gatekeeper is is a negative thing it, it's a filter some somebody has some taste somewhere that you trust you know you got your your friend that uh, whoever it is you know like the bartender or the whoever puts on the music you trust them yeah and you can ask and and hopefully it translates to journalists or or, or uh, whoever you know DJs yeah i mean like that's the way that i look at music journalism where honestly if i see a review by uh somebody who i don't think knows about music <laughs> then i'm gonna be just anywhere i'm not talking about ra specifically like I'm, I'm i'm gonna say that like oh well i'm gonna be like i read the review and they're talking about like how great uh i don't know panic at the disco is or something like that i'm gonna be like well this person's credibility in my eyes is not, this isn't the person that I trust as my filter. Yeah. So I think that, you know, if, if I listen to you play new records or I listen to somebody's radio show all the time, then you're trusting them as a filter. Yeah. And I think like in, in this era when you can basically listen to clips of most records that you'd buy at least, um instantly yeah then like the only the purpose of the journalist is to provide context like um and to be like a filter that's similar to similar to a dj or something Who, who's i mean so what what who are the big ones now like i mean you would think like a classic one would be like john peel or somebody like that um you know are there like some modern day people that you would trust is it is it is it DJs now, or is it just uh, like wh where has it gone to? Like, what are who are, who are the filters? Like, it, it almost seems like it, it's a, a Spotify algorithm. You know, it's like it's what do I trust personally? Mm, yeah, or or you maybe both. You know, what do you, what do you trust, and what do you think uh, is is affecting the people? Mm. Um, personally, like I've been enjoying certain journalists, like. Uh, radio shows like a lot of no, but online but who, radio. who are the certain journalists what journalists do i really like yeah. that like turn me on to new yeah, music yeah, yeah. um well maybe if you actually like the people to be know. like 100 percent honest like in terms of new stuff like it would be mailers from record stores so it's the low company mailer from London, okay. I, I really like this their is taste. John Ty, low low recordings. Uh, no, it's like low company. It's like oh. a record store in London, and it's it's like run by the people who did that label, Blackest Ever Black. Oh, okay, then no, I don't know. And they just cover a lot of like really bizarre private press stuff, and some techno, but like a lot of so post. So this is going to this is a record store mailing list. A record store mailing list. Okay. So low company, and then two bridges in you know that guy simon yeah. who runs the store like i think he does a good job of just being like here are five interesting things from this week and then typically you can go like listen to them on Bandcamp or something like that mm -hmm. and then in terms of djs like people like uh nose drip 
in Belgium. Like I feel like he plays a lot of new stuff. And he a has lot some. Of he has some label. Yeah, his label Stroom. Yeah, that d- yeah. dude put out really good stuff. Yeah, too. yeah. So like certain like it's more like, especially with labels like doing a mix of old and new stuff, they end up being like a filter as well. So. I'm sure like you're the same way, but you're constantly discovering old music as yeah, well as yeah. new music and you do it yourself. But why do, why do you think those two are, are better at it than others? Um, I think because they have a lot of investment in what's going on in the sense that where Simon from two bridges is figuring out how to distribute these records in the U S um, like he's gone so far as to like figure out how to ship the records from Europe to the U S he believes in them enough to like put them in this tiny store in Chinatown. And then he will still be negative about the record sometimes like in the mail or he'll be like, yeah, skip skip that track though. But like the rest of it's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's just like, it just comes across as very honest. Okay. And then the low company people, they're just like, they just have like really good taste but it's like a little bit like cool taste like where it's like we like deconstructed punk and noise and like maybe some like new yeah i don't know Br- british people are like good at it i don't know what they, <laughs> they like you think they're too in- slick no they i don't know they feel like they like invented music journalism they're like a the most time they do have a way of speaking about music that like they've like a put i don't know i feel like like that hardcore hardcore continuum are you familiar with that at all like it's like simon reynolds the music journalist like just wrote about um how hardcore translated to like drum and bass and two-step and garage 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 no i don't like this very like eloquent way um (laughs) but yeah like uh so y- so you get pretty deep into the music journalism you're you're, uh, you're you're you read it i i'd actually say that but it's not even that's not what even journalism. i just told you it's not even journalism no it's, it's a, yeah. but this that's like your pr background you're like appreciating this like good uh promotional emails <laughs> which is uh, but it's interesting but but i think it's cool because it goes back to like that's where stuff is actually selling like i keep saying is like you know you have this thing like records don't sell anymore you know, it's just hype. You know, it doesn't matter how popular it does on the internet. It might not translate to record sales. And I feel like real record fans are just reading like rub dub reviews yeah, or man. whatever. You know, like they they look at the new releases at Clone and uh, they're like, okay, I like this. And those are the people that are going to continue to buy records. Yeah. Versus the whatever the other stuff is. I... I mean, I agree with you, and maybe that's like a very old school way of looking at it. But like, there must be some new wave, but that w- we're not privy to. But the new wave is like Bandcamp and and yeah. like insane Bandcamp digging. But so so are these people like on um, Bandcamp? I know like when you sell stuff, it has like the people who bought it like under it. Their little pictures, they like click on it there's and a see what element. else see what else yeah. they bought. Can you write messages to each other? I guess you can, but there's no like public forum on Bandcamp, is there? I think that. Maybe there's users like a Reddit users are informed. An interesting thing about it is, users are informed when you buy some when somebody else buys something because they looked at their profile. Oh, I didn't know that. So I know like DJs who are like, "Oh, this other DJ just goes through every week and buys everything that I buy," <laughs> <laughs> and then they play it in their set. You know? Oh, yeah. Biters, biters. I mean, I mean that that used to be just like a. It, it was just a little bit later in the cycle, you know, like you play with this person every week and they hear you play it and then they play it the next week. Who are some of those people? I don't know. <laughs> They're around. <yeah. laughs> They're around. We're about to get really bad. That's <laughs> that. We're not, we're not going to get too terrible. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a, we could probably, uh, I don't, is there, in, should we go on? I don't want to get too crazy. You know, you have a job to keep and, well, and uh, basically it's also not good. Like, as, as we said before, like, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Well, I think I've been, like, fairly honest in, yeah, yeah. in answering your questions. I haven't, I haven't like, towed the company line per se. But, like, the only thing that I can say about it, and maybe this is something that I should say at the conclusion, but as is obvious from, like, the story I told, I never um, 
I never set out to be a music journalist. And I think I'm very lucky to be in the position that I'm in. And um, they give you health insurance? Yes. Jeez. And if you if you make a record or, you know, Jessica makes a record or um, John makes a record or whoever and they send it to me to review, no matter what I do, <coughs> if I listen to the entire catalog like over and over and try to like make sense of it, what I do does not compare to like the blood and sweat no. and time that goes into like actually making a good record i'm not saying like some like sometimes it takes five minutes <laughs> yeah no i mean obviously it takes five minutes but that doesn't yeah. include the uh yeah the training yeah so so like basically like i view like my position is like i'm i've always been primarily like a music fan yeah, whether well, it's playing music or reviewing music it's all like the extension of the same thing well, to I mean, me. you wouldn't exist without the musicians you know or you yeah. would exist but the ra wouldn't exist without musicians well, neither would djs you know yeah <laughs> i mean we could get yeah we could get pretty pretty uh negative real fast if we want <laughs> i'm but not trying to get negative no i'm I'm, just I'm, like, yeah. I'm trying not to yeah because it, it's there it's really a, a pointless thing but i is there any other what other uh can you think of anything that, that uh you w you wanted to bring up before we, we end this because maybe we've been going almost two hours now two hours yeah well and we were going to talk about being in the uh, uh playing with a uh acclaimed folk musician oh yeah, yeah oh, we gotta we have to we have to put that part of this in uh, and more but we've been talking we've been focusing on on only one aspect of your of your uh your life now and uh you're uh, uh you're in a band well, you're you're not even really in, you're. I don't know if it's a band, but you're you're hired to play the piano, the keyboard parts. Yes, yeah, synth and keyboard, and I wrote some of them as well. You wrote the parts or the songs? This the parts, and and uh, bef the songs. So you, you're this. You're writing for a woman named Jessica Pratt, and and uh, or you're not writing for her, but you're in the band for her, and uh, she's sitting right here too. So yeah. just just a full disclosure. <laughs> But she's not. She's not gonna make eye contact with me, so it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so you're you're touring with her, and she she writes the songs generally, and you're coming up with some parts with them. Are are the are you part of the recording process too? Or are you or maybe not the earlier stuff? No, not the first two records. Basically, Jessica and I also met at Amoeba. Oh yeah, when we were both employees. There. She was working there too. Yeah, she was working there. Oh wow, I didn't yeah. know that. If I didn't work at Amoeba, nothing your would your life would <laughs> be over. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a uh, insurance adjuster. You'd be writing. You'd be working for nonprofits, doing evil mm. things. No, I'd be going to the store and trying to like bust companies on like sharp CD cover edges. <laughs> <laughs> um. So so you, <laughs> but I, so so uh, my question, my, uh, what I really this is the moment that I would like to be explained is like. She probably has like some hits from her earlier albums. That's correct. And you're like adding these like background um, stuff to them. Like, do do the, f what do you think the fans think about that? <laughs> are they bummed you're like up there <laughs> with her? It's like some dudes that are like totally in love with her and like they're like, <laughs> who's this dude playing keyboard on my <laughs> on my shit? Or like so. Um, I mean that's Have that's a concern. That? That's a concern for <laughs> sure. Like I, I think that. What does she tell you? Does she give you any advice? Like stay in the background or like play quiet or. I like to be in the background, you know. Like I actually like when we line up. No, at, at every not. show. Yeah, you go. You go I'm, back. I'm, I'm, I'm like, Jessica. Can you move, move forward a couple inches? Your back. Line. I can't. I can't be in front of no, you. No, no. Yeah. Your tell her that. Your back line. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like I'd rather be like completely in the background. But it's honestly been I I think Jessica's music is amazing and I um I was involved in the recording of the last record mainly in um mainly in an advisory sense like this sounds good like yeah you should go with that and then uh because I was playing I sort of started playing live with her on an emergency basis um because promoters were expecting two people and as opposed to one well because what the tracks had some uh multi-track stuff because she had toured with the accompanist in the past ah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah so 
I s- we started out that's how it started essentially i was like well maybe i could put something together you just hold down like a c chord or something yeah you know just like uh <laughs> and then um and then it became a little more like i'm writing parts for these songs so we can play them live and some of those parts made it onto the, the record so like i'm on three tracks on the record um but what you say about like people who have been like huge fans of jessica's forever yeah. and yeah. it's like oh there's this like new guy up there like fucking around with yeah. Yeah. synths and stuff like what's stay what's in the up? background man. yeah yeah but but it's also like make sure that you don't play anything that would get in her way yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or that would make it worse no, but i mean I'm, i i've known I've, i don't know you guys super well but I, i've seen you over the years and you still seem to get along pretty well so it must be going okay she doesn't, she didn't, she doesn't, she still hangs out with you. you know? I mean, she hung out through our entire uh, four hour long conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I got air conditioning. It's not <laughs> that, it's not that bad. Uh, no, I mean, that's like a great test. It's like we, we've we uh, played maybe 40 shows this year in Europe and the U.S. Are there or maybe fi- Have 50. you had a screaming match? No. No, no. screaming, that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and I, I think that's like a <laughs> testament it's probably like due to her being conflict adverse though, you know? Like I'm I'm like a I'm a person who occasionally has has the occasional <laughs> argument, but uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's been a really nice thing and and it's also nice because I see like all my techno friends on tour yeah, as yeah. well. Like they come to the show, they seem to enjoy it. Yeah. Like and that's like the best thing about being able to do it is just like seeing your friends in yep. other cities. And that's the best thing with like, like, no, but I don't see for me, I don't even, it's not separate. It's like music friends. Yeah. You know, like totally. it, all the scenes should be together and, and it's weird that they're not. But I like, I like what you were saying earlier about, um, just wanting everything to be together. And, yeah. and that's like the initial parties I threw that had DJs at them was sort of the same concept. Yeah, you have a band and yeah, some like DJs after. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, I, I really love that. And um, yeah, I'm a lot of times when I think about music, like there will be like, I've really enjoyed like mixes where it's like a real music head playing like a dance music person like playing guitar music yeah. or something like that and i i've i've tended to see like less and less in genre i n- i noticed i i i did my radio show this week i did from the usb i noticed that uh i went through promos like for four or five hours and i noticed that and you know when you do that you're it's a split between reissues and new music and i noticed that the stuff that caught my ear recently had a rock element to it Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I hope that that's a trend to me. Like this, whatever this weird thing, it seems kind of like a flash in the pan to me. This whole like, whatever electro, then jungle, drum and bass, and this like gabber. Like it's, uh, I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, nobody really like that ever. <laughs> uh, like electro is cool if you listen to like Scorpio or something, you know. But n- I don't know. No one. That wasn't like a popular thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, drum and bass is so macho. It's weird. And, like. You're gonna g- g- like girls at your party, you know, like yeah. Um, I guess like people are focusing on like the '94. Yeah, like I, I hope it goes to the rock thing a little bit next, or at least you know that you can have a band play, like you know what, uh, you know, like what you said before, Happy Mondays or something yeah, like that. Yeah. It's like acid house band, or I don't know. We'll see. It. Have you noticed, like you're on the cutting edge or whatever, supposedly of the promo list and the, is there like a new thing coming that you see on the horizon or is it just the cycles are so quick now that i don't have any i have weird i don't actually think the cycles are that quick in electronic music now uh like as compared to like rap music or something yeah. where like today's biggest star like yeah they got like three weeks yeah man like becomes like they'll have trouble following up their big single um i think electronic music is moving slower than that um whereas um you know, like trance and progressive, like a cool version of progressive house, or like kind of like back a little bit. Um, Tribal. I mean, I I do like the the trend where people are playing slow. I think that 
I, I mean, I think that that's just because that like appeals to me personally. You're old. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's probably it. But like, um, you know, I like that people can like get out there and like play a dance floor set at like one o five a hundred right yeah, now. Yeah. And and I I think I think the reason I think that's interesting is because like the more restrictions that you have on on music that you DJ or you make, where it's like okay like straight down the middle like 120 125 128 yeah. like um the more like the less the more you're like likely to fall into conventions and stuff like that but i mean I, I, it's weird to me like i i i'm really into soundcloud lately for some reason it like got so much better lately because it seemed like everybody left mm-hmm. and you know sometimes you go to these mixes and, and it's like uh you can just predict exactly what it's going to be like it's like couple of you know start off with some ambient thing and then slowly build into this thing and couple african songs <laughs> and then like a little breakbeat thing and some house but it all sounds the same and they're like trying to pay play different genres it's so weird i don't uh, that's I don't, like i don't know where i'm going from this i think this that's people like trying to uh like imitate your boy Hooney, you know, like yeah. people like that, like who, who yeah, do that uh, very uh, well. So like a wannabe deck mental festival set. I mean, there is something to be said for the, uh, the prevailing like good taste Yeah, where it's like everything is in such good taste these yeah, days, yeah, you yeah. know, where it's like, and I, I think I, I play records as well. And like, I, I DJ, yeah. like I try to separate, I try to like, keep that pretty low key due to writing about dance music <laughs> um but i fall into that as well where it's like i'm gonna play this spiritual jazz thing into this ambient thing into like this like but but why music. is it why is it that some people can do it and it's okay and, and some people like huni can do it for some reason it's like cool you know i think he's just been doing it for a while except for when he plays latin i always get mad he's <laughs> not, it's so weird when he plays latin music I like what sort of Latin music? I don't know. I just uh, he has this. We- uh, he goes into like a little. I, maybe I haven't seen him play in so long. I don't know. I, I would maybe I'm just being a jerk. I Check out the Huni release on WT Records. Oh, it's a nice one. Yeah. Um, Stole it from Prince Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Why can some people do it? Because they're good at it. They practice he, it. Like I mean, uh, for him, knowing him for so long, I know that guy listens to a lot of music and he cares and he likes it and I think that it shows you know yeah some people are doing it just because they want to be the dj at that festival it's not because they're playing music and like sharing it for people well you know uh like tom cox like an infamous hater on the internet once said to me like um it used to be that you would dj because you had a lot of music and like at some point it became like you acquired music because you wanted to be a dj you know yeah. Like, and yeah, I think that I, w- I mean, I, I was thinking about this today. I, I, I w- when I was walking around, I was like, it, it doesn't matter how good you are now. It, it, matter, it matters your draw. Like if you can get people to come out, uh, then you're going to play more. That's it's always been how it is. Yeah. Though. So, I mean, it's, that's one of the, it's a factor and it's just how it is. It's not like good or bad. You know, if if you're also good, then it helps. You know, I don't. I'm. I don't know. I, I I was thinking about it today. I was like, it does. You know, there's a lot of people that are really good DJs and they they don't play very much, but you know, these young people that have tons of friends and, and you know they go out all the time and they meet everybody, they're gonna play all the time because their friends will come to the party, and if you're getting mad at them, you got problems. You know, <laughs> like they're that's that's how it works. You know, they're young people that socialize and. Like people like me, like I don't go out, I don't support, you know, like I, I did, but not anymore. So like those people are going to get the gigs, not me. Like, and if you're mad about it, then hmm, eh, eh. Too, yeah. ba- too bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, it seems like you've like come to a good place. Yeah. That's why I'm podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> but at least, you know, when you get booked, like it's only for the music, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's not for yeah. my draw, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not like bringing out 3,000 people. <laughs> yeah, but I think that from the lowest level to the highest level, it's like sort of a popularity contest. And especially if... Um, yeah, it's for sure. And our, all art. 
Yeah, and, and, and if people are, to extend that, if people are, like, just, like, searching on Bandcamp for the same music from, like, the same new labels and playing that, like, their sets aren't going to be, like, drastically different oh, either. Well, that's probably way better than just playing the promos you get sent. Oh, yeah, totally. But I respect you going through all your promos. Yeah, I mean, yeah. some you got to do it sometimes because yeah. there's a lot of good. Or, but it's not just when I say promos. I also have a lot of. I've been doing this for a little while, and I have a lot of friends that are involved, and they also really like music, and they send me stuff. That's your filter, man. So I get to hear. A, I got a lot of cool stuff pe- sent to me. You know, me but, too. But then you also have these emails. You're like, oh, luxurious problems. You know these. But get these but emails with these free it, but music. But it, it cheapens music somehow. It's like, well, you're just going to give me everything you have for free? Yeah, I will say this. I don't, um, I don't think of digital music as a commodity yeah. in any way. Yeah. And I don't really uh, respect it as a commodity. Yeah. Like, I, I think about my record collection, and, like, I buy too many records, and I try to... But you're, you don't buy music on the internet, or digital. I, I do occasionally, but I don't, like... I don't have like a meticulously organized digital collection. Yeah. It's all a mess, you know? And and I'll probably lose it at some point. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. Like it's it's not that's not like a crushing thing to me to lose all my MP threes or waves or something, yeah. you know? Like that it's it's more ephemeral to me. Yeah, you gotta have a product still. Yeah. I mean but I mean th- and that's a thing that uh, maybe it's just because I'm not touring, but I've pretty much only been playing records lately just because, I don't know, it's easy. It's, it became easier again or something. It's like yeah. cause I love so it when you play there, records. There's so much so much uh, digital that it's hard, you know, and then, you're, then you end up playing the same stuff because you're like, these are my 10 favorite songs. Mm. I'm just going to play them. But with records, you're like, oh, I just got this, so I'm going to play it. You're going to, like, give it a try at least, yeah. you know? And you, so was, I don't know. It's But mm, but then it, it, you're competing with these people that have their sets perfectly uh beat matched you know you know and they're like no mistakes it's they so have their like cue points and yeah, like yeah. notes and stuff i mean it's cool but it's like dang man it's weird it's weird it's nice to hear a bad mix you know we don't <laughs> we don't have any more wine i got some weird like ginger drink that we can drink that um we, we i think we've covered pretty pretty good uh spectrum we went over two yeah. hours so even with the bathroom break well, um, and uh, I hope uh, you didn't say anything you regret. And you, and you no, not not d- at all. Don't lose your job or anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, I think like we talked about a few things, and one of them was like, obviously, like I tried to be as honest as possible while while no, still I understanding yeah. that. Uh, yeah. And and yeah, I appreciate yeah, you. It's, uh, it's careful. You got to be careful as a music journal- journalist to get a good target a target on you. Got to watch out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing you can say about that. But uh, um, Matthew McDermott, uh, what's your middle name? Edwin. Matthew Edwin McDermott. <laughs> Thank you very much. You should use it when you write. Oh yeah, it's you know, it's like a, a it's a good name. Like like lended and aristocratic. But Edwin's flair. not in the Bible, is it? No, Edwin is not. Who's in the Edwin? Bible. Edwin is my father and my grandfather, actually. So instead of being a third, you you got a, a biblical, a biblical name and a generational middle name are you the oldest i am okay so that's why that's why it took me so long to get into cool music i so didn't have like a cool <laughs> older a cool brother sister <laughs> no no gatekeeper yeah. yeah exactly so um matthew edwin mcdermott thank you um for coming by and uh i, I hope it was okay for you oh it's my pleasure i hope uh it's, okay. it's really an honor to be here and i got some weird ginger drink we can have in the other room <laughs> all right thanks everybody thanks. for listening thanks guys